Hello and welcome to my channel. My GTI is now three years old and has nearly 93,000 miles on it. I figured I'd share with you what's gone wrong and what's gone right and what I think of the car overall. Stick around. The short version, the car's fantastic. I can't see myself getting rid of it anytime soon. Some things have broken, so let me tell you what's going on, what's been happening with it. I will start with the things that you cannot see, and that would be uh, things that were wrong with the car upon delivery. It's a well-known problem that uh, Volkswagens are often delivered with the shipping pucks still installed on top of the front suspension, and I was no exception to that. I discovered that, and on top of that, uh, I had a glass defect. Uh, you can't see it. I tried to take pictures of it, but you just can't see it in a camera but you sure can see it when you look out the window and so the dealer replaced that glass under warranty and I also had a lighting issue in the front passenger door the uh, little LED strip lighting wasn't working they had to replace the entire door panel to fix that and that's not a problem sometimes things happen and everything's been great ever since delivery let me go over some problems that I've had with the car some of them are Volkswagen's fault and most of them are not uh, we'll start at the front let me go ahead and open up the hood Welcome to my engine bay. Uh, the first thing I'll talk about is something that we cannot see from here. I had APR stage one. I flashed to that at around 15,000 miles. And then the factory clutch lasted for another, I think about 15,000 miles. Then I needed to replace it. And while the clutch was being replaced, the mechanic noticed what appeared to be some leaking from the differential. So we went ahead and wiped it all clean. We couldn't figure out where the oil leak was coming from. And then after a while, I concluded that there just wasn't a leak. I had mentioned the, uh, the strut packing pucks. Uh, that's something that, that should have been removed during the pre-DI, the uh, pre-delivery inspection at the dealer. And so um, I guess somebody got a little lazy or forgetful and, and didn't take them off. Likewise, I believe the oil that we had found at the bottom of the transmission or the differential was a result of somebody uh, being sloppy as they topped off the, uh, the oil here and that maybe it dribbled down uh, the back of the engine and then came out. It just kind of collected inside of some crevices around the transmission and the differential and just pulled in there and then slowly leaked out as I drove the car. And so there really wasn't a leak at all. I guess that's not really a problem with the car. That's a problem with the dealer and the PDI. Uh, another thing, uh, now I can start pointing out things here under the hood. Uh, my coolant, I, I think I consume a little bit. You can see that right now it's just a tad low. If this is three quarters of an inch, I go through about three quarters of an inch of coolant every, I'm going to guess about six months. I don't document each time I top it off. And so it's being consumed somewhere. I don't know where it goes. It doesn't leak. I can't find the telltale white chalky streaks anywhere to, to show me that there's a leak somewhere. So it, it must be being consumed. And it's been going on since the car was new. And I think I've heard of other people having it happen. So it might be a normal VW thing. Tell me what you think. Um, also up here, this is uh, uh, obviously a larger battery, but I had suffered a dead battery early in the car's life, and it was um, self-inflicted. I was stranded, at, well, I don't want to say stranded at home, but, you know, we were snowed in, and they don't do snow removal around where I live. And so I was stuck home over the weekend. The car was parked, and I had made the mistake of leaving an OBD-11 dongle plugged into the OBD port. And apparently, the ECU and bits and pieces of the car talk when there's something interfacing with the uh, port. And because my key was within, I will just say, a range of the car, the dongle, the car, and the key were just having a party all weekend long until the battery died. And so getting the car jump-started the following Monday before going to work was a little bit of a challenge because of the way I had the cars parked and the streets hadn't been plowed or anything. So that's kind of self-inflicted. But eventually the battery did die around uh, two and a half years I can't remember how many miles that was. I'm just going to guess and say it was 70,000. And that's fairly common with the Mark 7. Seems like the, uh, the battery specified for the car is just barely large enough for the job. I think it was a Group 47. I now have a Group 48 
uh, battery in the car and it's I don't know it's about that much longer so the the factory battery was about to here and now I've added another couple of inches and uh, more capacity and uh, about the same cold starting capacity it's just more reserve capacity for running electronics and stuff so I can't think of anything else under the hood here um, you can't see it let me see if I can just get down there I'm upside down here but I did put the little blocking plate back here so that the air then goes in and properly through here and into the intake and as you can see I am still with the factory intake I have removed the snow screen and I'm stage two now and th the car seems to breathe fine uh, let me show you around some more stuff uh, at the front of the car since I'm here uh, I don't know if you can see it, but uh, I've got I've got a clear bra on here I, I think you can maybe see the line right there, and then I've got some rock chips the rock chips I can feel them I think you can see them, but they do not go all the way through and so this stuff has been really great for protecting The paint I suppose if I were to heat it up and remove it then then my paint would be all pretty and perfect under there uh, this one right here is kind of severe I think you might be able to barely see that it's it's a dent. Whatever it was that hit me, it hit so hard that it dented the car. And I can't feel that dent, but if I get the light on it just right, I can see it. And I'm going to have a uh, paintless dent wizard take a look at it, see what he can do. Chris, I will be in touch if you're watching this. There's not really access underneath because there's a, uh, a steel internal piece in here to keep a tool from getting into there. So he might be able to, I don't know, use a, a cup or something to suck it out. I'm not sure. But he's the pro. I'll let him figure it out. And then I have paint protection film on the headlights also. And you can barely see there's a like a scratch right there where I hit something. Another one there and there. And over here on the driver's side, you can see quite a bit of pitting. And again, this is in the paint protection film, but it's not in... The headlight itself i'm very confident that i could peel this off and it'd be perfect under there this paint protection film has been great if you can uh, swing it and your car is new and has no flaws in the paint yet i'd say go for it uh, here's another example of a piece actually there it is there's another scratch in the in the uh, paint protection film there's just little pieces you know maybe some edges that are starting to come up but it's not a it's not a big deal Next up on problems I've had with the car, uh, glass breakage. The original windshield, I remember even when the car was brand new, I was kind of dissatisfied with the clarity of the windshield. Uh, I lived with it though because I loved the car and then it didn't take long. Uh, I'll flash the mileage up here. Uh, I don't remember when I broke it, but I, it got cracked. It got hit with something. It didn't seem like it was even that hard of a hit. And then it got replaced with not an OEM glass, but instead a glass by, ooh, I can't remember how to say it. Their abbreviation is FY. I'll flash it up on the screen. They're a very popular aftermarket glass maker. And this thing has been tough as nails. Uh, here's some pits. I got pits in different places where rocks have hit. And these have not been small hits either. These have been the kind of hits that startle you as you're driving down the road and it's just shocking to me that the glass hasn't cracked with some of these things. And so this replacement glass has been great. And it was far more clear than the factory glass. About three weeks after I had this glass replaced, I then blew out the passenger side rear window. <laughs> I was cutting the grass. Uh, something got tossed up and blew out the window. And uh, the guys at the glass shop were pretty surprised to see me back so soon. But uh, so now I, I've got a, a non-factory glass in the back of the car. Moving on, you'll notice I do not have a sunroof. This is the sport trim, which is basically a half a step between the base S and the SE model. And I don't miss the sunroof at all, especially when I read about all the problems that people have been having with, say, a cracked frame or something leaking, just little things and VW never seemed to fix it, so I'm glad I don't have a sunroof. The next thing I will point out, this is a common complaint. It's, it's got to be just the shape of the roof. Something going on here that when you use the windshield wiper, the, the sprayer, I should say, or 
if you've got water standing on top of the roof, which my water beads really well with the uh, ceramic coating that I have on the roof, if you have your window down, the water will just roll right over this and then come into the car and it typically lands all over the power window switches and everything. So it has become my habit to just leave the windows up so that I don't have to worry about that uh, until the car is dry. It's, it's just a new habit. Moving to the inside of the car, I had been, been driving myself nuts trying to find a creaking noise that was in here. I thought maybe this interior was working its way loose. I had removed this to run wiring underneath this, and so I thought maybe this was creaking. And forever, I just couldn't find out what it was until finally it got so bad that it was undeniably coming from right here. There is a 10 millimeter triple square bolt under here, and that is for the door check. And when it comes loose, it starts to make a creaking noise that transmits through the entire door, and it sounds like it's right by your head. Once it gets really loose, then it makes a terrible noise right there when you open and close the door, and then it's obvious. Just throw some Loctite on there and crank it down. Uh, don't overdo it because the threads are kind of fine pitched, so I don't know how strong they are, but just put a little bit of torque on there and you'll get the thing tightened down just fine and you'll be able to get along. The next item on the interior is my seat bolster. I am tall, long legs, bad hips, and I tend to rub right here. And so I have been wearing this bolster away far sooner than I should have. Uh, I have slowed this wear by adjusting the way I get into the car. I kind of swing my hips in a little bit farther before I sit down. Um, when I get into the car, it's kind of a controlled fall. <laughs> it's, a, it's a hip thing. I won't bore you with the medical details, uh, but I can get this fixed. Uh, I took it to an upholstery shop once and they just recommended I leave it be until it wears through, but I've improved my seating method. And so I think I am going to go ahead and take this and get it fixed. But this is, you know, 90,000 miles worth of driving and that's not bad for a tall guy. Related to this, another thing tall people will identify with is how I've blown this out. Uh, I rub on that too when I get in and out. This was a problem on my Jetta as well when I had it. it has to do with the short uh, door jams. If I had a two door, then this B pillar would be way back there and then I wouldn't be able to touch this with my hip. But I probably still would be catching this seat piece here. So it's just something to keep in mind. You have to adjust the way you get in and out of the car and everything will be fine. Um, next up was the leather here on the parking brake. There used to be leather there and it worked its way loose. It's just basically held on through pressure. And it turned out that this piano finish here, I like it just fine. It feels fine and it's still very functional. And so I decided not to replace it. I'm just living with it the way it is. So there it is. Um, Oh, look at that. This piece here, it looks kind of purple here, but it's not. It's, it's black. This material here, because I use this armrest, I was constantly getting, say, dead skin buried in there. And it would come up when I was vacuuming, or if I tried to wipe it, it would get all chalky on here. And it's basically dead skin. It's a little gross if you think about it that way, but I got this infant skull cap and slipped it on there, and it... It hasn't been getting nasty at all, but if it does, then I just pull it off and wash it and stick it back on. So it's kind of like a little condom for my armrest. I like it. And the final piece in here would be the cabin blower. You can't see it. I forget what the mileage was when it failed, but it, it did fail and you access it all from right down there. I've got a video on how to replace it. And it was simple and it's not an expensive thing to replace. It just sort of happens. On to the trunk. Um, back here, the, uh, the carpet, see how that comes up. This is a common problem on apparently the 2017s and only the 2017s. I'm not sure what they used to hold this on. It's different than everything else, but this is coming up. So I need to get it off, clean it, and then maybe use some contact cement to hold it in place. And I've heard that I'd never have another problem with it if I use contact cement. And let's see, up here, I don't know if you can see that, but this is scratched up pretty good. 
I have, uh, this is a working car. You've seen me haul trailers and stuff, and I also put lumber in here sometimes. If it just barely fits, I can put a, an eight foot long two by four in here and it, it scratched this all up. That's just a, a, it's just a fact of life. It's not gonna stay perfect forever. I've considered coating this with a bed liner, but it just hasn't been a priority. And I'm sure you're gonna ask about the fire extinguisher. I used to have a cheapy red powder extinguisher. That stuff can be kind of corrosive to electronics. And so I don't really ever wanna use one of those on my car. This extinguisher is uh, packaged with Halotron or Halotron, however you say it. I remember uh, Halon 1301, we used it on the ships uh, when I was in the Coast Guard and that stuff's since been outlawed because it's bad for the ozone. So now you have this Halotron replacement and it is extremely effective against fires. Um, the only other thing I can think of that has not been peachy with my car is the wheels. Now, you've seen these wheels before. These are the Nogaro uh, factory wheels, 18 inches. And a common complaint with people that have 18 inch wheels is they don't hold up so well to potholes. And so I have bent two of these and then I got them re-straightened. So this, this is actually one of the wheels that was bent as was, you know, both wheels on the left side have been bent, but they've also been straightened. And if you've been watching my channel, then you might recall that I have another set of these that are refinished in gunmetal gray. And I love those so much more. Uh, the only reason they're not on the car right now is because I had a really nasty puncture. Uh, I was able to plug it and continue on for several months, but then the belt eventually failed and I got a lot of really bad cupping on one of the wheels. And so right now I'm just running on these wheels temporarily until I can get new tires mounted on my uh, gunmetal gray wheels. They look so much better, but I, I'm living with these for a little while. And uh, yeah, life is good. The car still drives great with different color wheels. It doesn't matter. It just doesn't quite meet my fashion standards. <laughs> so there you have it. I think I've covered everything. Uh, you know, there is one more thing that I didn't touch on, and that is I've added a steel oil pan to the car. And I did the same thing on my daughter's car as well. And you know, it's, it's such a hassle to get these things to seal up right. You're warned, we're warned, don't use too much of the, uh, of the adhesive or the sealant under there uh, to seal the pan up to the bottom of the engine. Otherwise you might get some seep in and then get stuck up in the engine. But then if you don't use enough, you develop a leak or leaks. And I found the leak on her car first and I just figured, all right, she didn't put it on properly. So then I, I redid it and man, cleaning that stuff off the bottom of the engine is a real hassle. You know, get it all perfectly clean and then reseal it. And then I was under my car recently and I found a very, very slow leak on mine, which a slow leak can still make a big mess. Uh, I haven't decided if I'm going to take the thing back off, but if I do, I'm really tempted to just put that factory plastic pan back on because it's got a proper gasket on it. Tell me what you think. If I had to do it all over again, knowing what I know now, I think I would go for this for the skid plate rather than the steel pan. The skid plate can protect the plastic pan. The plastic pan has a proper gasket on it. I think it's less prone to leaking. But you people who have uh, older GTIs, Mark 7 GTIs, who have not upgraded your, your oil pan to steel, tell me, did your factory oil pan eventually leak or seep or anything like that? And if it did, then I guess it's pointless for me to go back. But I'm thinking about going back. But that's all I have for today. Uh, let me know what you think. Feel free to ask any questions. I'll be glad to answer them. And as always, I appreciate you being here. Thank you very much. Please subscribe if you like what I'm doing and I will try to continue to turn out some videos for you. Thanks a lot. Have a good one. The car has been fantastic. It's, I used to think that my TDI was the best car I'd ever owned. And then the next TDI was uh, a good car, but not quite as good as my Mark III. And then I switched to this thing, and uh, the TDI is no longer the king of torque. This thing is, is awesome with a tune. I've got APR Stage 2 on it now, and all I can say is why did I wait so stinking long to get a GTI? They're, they're fantastic cars. Um, I have a small teeny-weeny concern about crank walk because that's been coming up lately. 
uh, JR14, if you follow his channel, has experienced it, but he also has a, uh, a much different setup in his car than, than I do. So I, even though I tow a lot and I put a lot of strain on my drivetrain, I suspect he's putting more on his than I do on mine. So maybe I'm okay. <laughs> but uh, go visit his channel, give him some love. And uh, I'm, I'm watching, I'm watching his, his outcome. For now, I still love the car. I'm going to keep on driving it. At my rate of driving, I'm probably going to have 150,000 miles on it when it's five years old and probably will keep going. So that's it. Let me know if you have any questions about the car. I'd be glad to answer. And as always, thanks for being here. Subscribe if you like what I'm giving you. And I'll talk to you next time. Take care.